First reading today is from 1 Corinthians 9, starting at 16. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew, in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might be all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share it in its blessings. Our holy gospel is taken from Matthew chapter 10. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics, or sandals, or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy, and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. It's good to be back. This um, church has a very fond place in my heart. I was here for about 10 years um, until 2005. I did my internship here. Some of you remember me from that, and I was also doing visitation pastor role here, and I got ordained here and served as an associate for about five years, and then I returned to private practice as a therapist full-time in 2005. Now I'm retired, and I get to come back, so it's fun to see you. When my kids were little, they used to sit on the floor and turn around and use the pew as a desk for their coloring books. And I remember one time my son Mike, he was about four at the time, said, a Christian is someone who follows Christ, but you can't see Christ, so I hope they know the way. (laughs) I remember that. I've never forgotten it. He's now a 38-year-old man. Um, But that stuck with me that he was listening to the sermon and processing what was being said, and that always, I thought, was very wise for a little four-year-old boy to think like that. When we read a passage like our story in Matthew today of Jesus giving instructions to his followers, some of us feel a deep sense of relief that as Lutherans, we don't take the scripture literally, right? The story makes us uncomfortable Don't take your backpack and water bottle, your credit cards, your phone. Go to, say, Burnsville and go into the neighborhood and and pick a house on one of the blocks there and ask to live with them for a while and talk about Jesus and then spread that word to all their neighbors. Oh, and when you're there, go ahead and find out who's worthy. Um, That's a whole other problem, right? (laughs) Heal people, raise the dead. Do you see the problems with this story? God's work, our hands, sometimes the gospel does not sound like good news, right? Then there's this issue of the kingdom of God has come near. It's been a couple thousand years. It feels a little awkward to keep saying this quote from Jesus. 
Then we have Paul's words in Corinthians in which he wants us to be like everyone we meet. You could hear this as be pleasing or listen to the people that you meet and try to understand their lives and those who are really different from you and your experiences. Jesus' words are oftentimes disturbing. You've all noticed that, right? Not what we want to hear on Sunday mornings. We come to worship to hear something that's reassuring or moving. We need a message that will carry us through another week in this time that has so much distressing news and, and so many hard issues. We come to be filled up with peace and music and prayers that feed us and connect us with others here, the people who are like us here in this church. Jesus is asking us to go outside the walls and do things that are totally counter to our instincts. We want safe and secure, and Jesus is saying to us, not until all of God's children feel safe and secure. Isn't this, in essence, the message that brought you into your faith to begin with? I'm in. I belong. When I was growing up, I grew up in Los Angeles, and it was a mission church, and um, we had Pastor Erickson, and he couldn't preach to save his soul. It was horrible. This is in, and I'm not talking just as a child who was growing up there. All the grown-ups would say, he's the worst preacher we've ever had. But we all really dearly love Pastor Erickson and his family. And Pastor Erickson had a way of getting people to participate and do things at church. Um, when I was about nine or ten, I remember him coming up one time and he put his arm around me and said, Karen, Bev's got a lot of kids in the VBS this year in the art class, and I'm thinking maybe you should go in and be a teacher's helper. Help her out with all those kids or it's going to be chaos. Would you do that? Now, you guys are probably thinking, geez, if you grow up in L.A., you probably get the summer to just go hang out at the beach. And that was my plan, by the way. But... When Pastor Erickson asked, then you did it. And what was interesting in that experience is that afterwards I felt so good inside. I knew that Pastor Erickson was, he knew my name. And he also was noticing me. He was saying, I need you and I want you to help. And he asked it of me. And so I felt a sense of pride. And I would put that as a person of faith as that was one of those seeds that were planted in me, evangelism, planting seeds. Later, I recall in high school, Pastor Erickson did this again, put his arm around my shoulders, and said, Karen, we're having a conference of all the Lutheran churches in California up in San Francisco. Would you be willing to go as a youth representative from our church? So I went, and I knew all the grown-ups who were going. In fact, I think I knew everyone by name in my church, and they all knew me. So that was fun and very comfortable. I went to this conference, and now I think this is the 60s, right? So the music was great. It was all folk music, folk-based faith songs. Um, and it was the first time that I had ever seen the, the larger church come together. All these Lutheran churches in California, I only knew about our church. I didn't realize how many churches there were and how many other people believed the same way we did. Um, and I remember feeling that time, another one of those moments where you feel like a pride in your church and in your faith tradition. And I also had that sense of feeling, importance too big a word. I felt pride, I think, that Pastor Erickson thought that I could go and represent us and gave me this opportunity. Um, and I would say another seed was planted, right, in evangelism in my faith. And to use the words that Jesus is saying, thy kingdom came near. God's kingdom comes near to us in those moments where it becomes very thin between us and God, and we feel that connection of the Spirit. I went from L.A. to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to Augustana College. Now, that's a whole other story we can talk about, how you get a kid from L.A. to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. But I went to Sioux Falls, and my freshman year, I took freshman English, and I wrote my first paper, and Harriet Scott, my professor, said on the paper in a big red letter, F, see me. I went in after, kind of sheepish and, and really embarrassed, right, to get an F on a paper in college. That wasn't a good start, right? 
um, I went in to see her, and she said, where did you grow up? And I said, in Los Angeles. And she said, they have a horrible school system there. You can't write to save your soul. This is terrible. You, you need to learn grammar and the basics and how to create a, a sentence <laughs> and not run on in all your sentences. Um, and so she said, if you are willing, I will work with you. Come in once a week, and I'll go through your papers with you and teach you the tools you need so that you can write a decent paper. So I did that, and this would be 1974. And I graduated from college, and um, about three years ago, right before COVID hit, I read in the alumni news that um, Professor Scott was coming to town to do some fundraising for Augustana. And I thought, oh, I should go down and tell her. I bet all these years, I never really, at 18, said thank you for what you did. So I thought, well, I'm going to go down and say thank you and see her again. So I went down where she was speaking, and I said hi to her after her um, speech. And I had to introduce myself. I had changed a little bit in those years. And um, so I, I told her, you know, I wanted to come and just thank you because you worked with me when I was a freshman at college. And after you worked with me, I had gone to some more years of college, and I never got below an A following that. And I said, that really built confidence in me that I could do the work and that I, I could succeed. Then she gave me a hug. Oh, that's great. And then I stood there for a few minutes, and I said, Karen, you should tell her the truth. You know that truth where it's a little risky and you feel vulnerable to say the real truth? So I said, I need to tell you the truth. I came down here tonight not to tell you that I did fine in school, but to tell you what it meant to me in my life that you said I was worth working with, that you put time into developing me and creating a relationship with me, and you cared. You knew who I was, and it mattered. And it created one of those seeds for me. Again, the kingdom of God came near when somebody reaches out and they care and they show you through whatever gifts they have in the world that you matter, that they want you, that they want relationship. So Pastor Erickson and Professor Scott and many other people develop us in our faith journey. Can you think of some of the people who, you know, as I share, come to mind that have developed you and known you and put their time and their care into you and it's a part of what continues to grow your faith. How many of you can think of some people that have been like that in your life? That's what we're here talking about today with evangelism and God's work, our hands. People who see our potential, or maybe they don't even see our potential, but they know that each one of us is longing for someone to know who we are and to walk with us in this time particularly these times where it's really hard in our world. So most of us, and I, don't, I can't speak for all of you, but most of us have a part inside of us that feels undeserving because we have these stories in our mind that brings up all the reasons we're undeserving. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> those, those ones, the ones that put you down and say you're never quite good enough. Um, and we come to church, and the words that we hear are, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I was sharing with the first service that I was thinking about my sermon this morning, and I was getting myself ready, and I looked in the mirror, and I thought, maybe we should take those dry erase markers and put on the mirror, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Because I don't know about you, but I kind of could use that every day when the, as soon as you start, the criticism in your mind, those stories start of I'm not worthy, I'm never quite there. And I could use that reminder that I do believe to be truth, that nothing can separate me from God's love. It's not about what I do or how I look or what I've accomplished or don't accomplish. It's there for me. I'm in. I belong. What God in, has done in our lives isn't 2,000 years old. Remember in the beginning of the sermon I said from the scripture, we talk about this story of Jesus saying the kingdom of God has come near and we think, well, I, you know, I've heard that my whole life. It doesn't seem like it's coming really close. 
this is what that is referring to. It's referring to each time we share our faith story or we see another person in who they are, the kingdom of God comes near to us. So it's a fresh story. It's a fresh story that every time our hearts are moved by the music, does that happen to you too? That you don't expect, in fact, I always find church kind of funny because I don't know what part of church it's going to happen in, but every time I go to worship, there's a place where I'm a little moved. I don't tell anybody. You guys probably don't either, right? You know, that little words in the music or um, seeing a young child this morning or you hear something in the prayer, something touches you. Those are the moments where the kingdom of God comes near. There's a thin veil that's been lifted and our hearts and our faith are touched once again and refreshed. So tell your story. Tell your story to the people who are here because they want to know your story and to the people that you meet because they have those same stories in their minds that they're unworthy or unlovable in some way. Listen and try to understand them and what's happened in their life that they felt like they're on the outside, not, on, not inside. Make room in your hearts and your homes and in your lives for other people's stories to move you and then connect with them. That's what evangelism is. The peace that Jesus describes is a deep felt knowing that even though there is a lot of distress in our world, the kingdom of God comes through each time we make a connection and give that acceptance or help or support to others who haven't yet heard the news. As we're talking this morning and Molly announced, when you go feed people, you might think of it as just a job you're doing. Oh, I volunteered, they need seven here. Okay, fine, I'll go. You don't know how God is going to take that moment and somebody who comes through says, wow, you're here, you cared. We don't see exactly the connections, but afterwards, sometimes we have to share with each other, here is where that occurred for me. Does that make sense? That's our evangelism. It's through the regular things you're doing Serving, being a neighbor, being a partner, being a parent, being a child. It's that care and understanding that we're talking about. Heal people's wounds through your acceptance and your understanding. Raise them from the dead of their depression and their unworthiness with your kind words and listening to them. When we open our hearts to see each other, Jesus fills us with a peace that's really hard to describe in words, but the kingdom of God has come near. Amen.